Hello and welcome to this lecture on Plato's Republic Book 6. And in this lecture, in this book of the Republic, we're going to continue um, the theme of the, the philosophers, the philosopher kings that emerged in Book 5. Um, and here we're going to see Plato's take on how the philosophers were seen at, at, in, in his time, how they were perceived, and what are the common opinions about philosophers. And we'll also look at a sort of perspective on the sophists and their role in, in, in opposition or in contrast to the philosophers. And also importantly, we'll also introduce the idea of the Plato's theory of the forms or the ideas in this chapter and how that relates to um, some of the themes in the book as, as a whole that we've seen emerging. And we're going to see, uh, we're going to pursue that further in chapter seven. Um, and, and that's going to be a, a theme there as well. So we're going to get a sense of, of how this ties into Plato's theory of knowledge, his epistemology, and his metaphysics, his theory of reality. Um, and these are really highlighted, I think, very, um, very, in a very sort of clear fashion by the theory of the forms. Okay, so let's just review um, what, we, what we've been going through so far. We've talked about um, the three classes in the city. We've seen who those classes are composed of. Uh, we know the rulers are philosophers. Um, and we've outlined the three, the three parts of the soul. Uh, and we've seen how they correlate to the three classes in the just city as, as well. Um, and there's a sense in which each one of the classes and each part of the soul um, has a distinct kind of interest, a distinct kind of focus. Um, and in the case of the, the lower faculties, the appetite, um, that focus is pleasure. Um, satisfaction, um, desire wants to be satisfied, and there's a pleasure in its satisfaction. In the case of spirit and the, um, the sort of warrior class, it seems natural to identify that with, with the pursuit of honor and glory. Um, so it's not so much pleasure as it is the sort of the sense of honor, the sense of, of respect and the sense of self-esteem and the social status that that sort of comes with doing this sort of um, social social task, doing the task of protecting or the, or the task of, of being a warrior, um, leads to um, sort of social acc accolades like honor and glory. Um, and that's the attraction for, for you know, this, this sort of form of social activity. That's what it's after that's what the people who do this sort of activity that's what they're after that's what they're interested in and finally we've seen the rulers um, who are sort of interested in the possession of wisdom um, knowledge and expertise for its own sake um, so that's a very that's a sort of distinct a distinct interest and we see that sort of expressed in the text in this chapter when Socrates talks about the philosophic nature um, as though the three kind of classes each have a, their own distinctive nature, their own distinctive interest. Um, and so philosophers are concerned with the pleasures of the soul, not the pleasures of, of the body. So wisdom is, is, the, is the pursuit of philosophers, uh, the pursuit of learning and knowledge about about the whole, about the sort of public as a whole, about society as a whole, not about a specific class or a specific interest, but knowledge of, of the whole. That, say Socrates, is the concern of, of the philosopher. So it's interesting to sort of separate out the three classes in this way in terms of what they're oriented towards, in terms of what their interest is, what they pursue. Um, and we can sort of, you know, um, play out the, the differences there in terms of pleasure and honor and glory, which is sort of social accolades and social esteem and wisdom, uh, which is a very sort of intellectual uh, reward, a kind of intellectual goal um, rather than sort of bodily pleasure and bodily satisfaction. Right now in this chapter, 
we learn about the the two great philosophical camps in everyday life. Um, at least we're told this was the case in in ancient Athens, where the opinions of philosophers, the reputation of philosophers in Athens, we're told um, are of there of two kinds basically. There are some philosophers that fall into the useless camp, and there are some philosophers that fall into the vicious camp. Um, so it's so uh, neither of these are obviously particularly complimentary. Um, philosophers wouldn't take any great pride, I don't think, in being called useless, um, certainly not in being called vicious. But Socrates tells a story about how um, how these two how these two camps um, come about, and it, it's like with the vicious the vicious camp of philosophers. Socrates tells us are almost like um, philosophers that didn't have the right training, philosophers that weren't trained in the right way, but that, but were given a bad rearing, um, and of course that means everything sort of noble in their character becomes very um, depraved and twisted, and they turn vicious. Um, so there's a kind of there's a kind of bad or a harmful type of philosopher, that is a philosopher that was given the wrong training or a bad training um, and in effect in consequence turns vicious and doesn't have the good of the city um, and the sort of ethical well-being of the people um, in their sights. Instead they're, um, they're self-interested, they're interested in um, profiting for themselves and so on. The other camp, the useless um, philosopher, so Socrates says, well, philosophers, when they're not seen as vicious, in other words, when they're not harmful, they're seen as simply useless, as though that's um, somehow better than being vicious. And I guess in a sense, in a sense it is, but it's still, um, you know, it's still not the situation uh, philosophers would ideally like to be in. Nobody really wants to think of themselves um, as useless. Interestingly, Socrates will say here that the that uselessness, the sort of perception that philosophers are useless, is actually a consequence of society not being organized in the right way. And if society were organized in the right way, philosophers wouldn't be useless at all, but they would have, they would have found their role. Now, of course, we know from chapter five what that role is, what the in the perfectly perfectly just and perfectly well-run city. We know the role of philosophers um, is to rule the city and to look out for the general good. But of course, in a, in a society that doesn't want people looking out for the general good to rule or hasn't figured out how to make that happen, um, it looks like philosophers are without a role. So it looks like philosophers are useless. And it looks like, you know, it, it's like Socrates is saying, well, that perception of uselessness don't blame philosophers for that. That's a result of the way that society is 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 sort of incorrectly set up in an in a less than perfectly rational and perfectly just fashion. Now, right after distinguishing those two, um, on page one hundred and sixty-eight, Socrates comes to one of the most famous analogies in, in the book as a whole, uh, what's often referred to as the ship analogy. And it takes up that idea of the sort of useless philosopher and it puts it in the context um, of Socrates' sort of um, comic depiction of what life is like in a democracy, right? And remember, this is um, this is sort of the experience of, of the Athenians and Plato and Socrates lived through that experience of the democracy um, in the in, in the fifth century, and we saw um, the sort of the development of that democracy and its eventual downfall. And here is Socrates giving us this, I think, powerful metaphor for understanding democracy and also understanding in relation to philosophy. Let's read through and see if we can we'll pick up some important things on the way. So he says, conceive of something of this kind happening. So the ship owner, though the ship owner on board surpasses everyone else in height and strength, he is rather deaf and likewise short sighted and his knowledge of seamanship is on the same level. So the sailors are quarreling with one another about the piloting, each supposing he ought to pilot 
the ship or prove there was a time when he was learning it. Besides this, they claim it isn't even teachable and are ready to cut to pieces the man who says it is teachable. And they are always crowded around the ship owner himself, begging and doing everything so that he'll turn the rudder over to them. And sometimes if they fail at persuasion and other men succeed at it, they'll either kill the others or throw them out of the ship. In chaining the noble ship owner with mandrake drink or something else, they rule the ship using what's in it, and drinking and feasting they sail as such men would be sought, thought likely to sail, um, badly I, I would assume. Besides this, they praise and call skilled sailor pilot a knower of the ship's business, the man who is clever at figuring out how they will get to rule, either by persuading or by forcing the ship owner, while the man who is not of this sort they will blame as useless. Note this word coming up here, um, the uselessness. The useless. We know who that is, right? So that's going to be the philosophy here. They, <coughs> excuse me. They don't know that for the true pilot, it is necessary to pay careful attention to year, seasons, heaven, stars, wind, and everything that's proper to the art, if he's really going to be skilled at ruling a ship. So it's as though ship, ship governing or sort of ruling the ship, Socrates is saying here, is a kind of expertise, or it requires a kind of expertise. You have to know things in order to do it. You have to know the art of the seasons, the heavens, the stars, the winds, etc. And they don't suppose it's possible to acquire the art and practice of how one can get to hold onto the helm, whether the others wish it or not, and at the same time to acquire the pilot's skill. So with such things happening on ships, don't you believe that the true pilot will really be called a stargazer? So here we go, here's the insults for philosophers. A stargazer, a praetor, um, somebody who talks about useless things, and useless to them, by those who sail on ships run like this, right? So, so let's sort of, let's, we can see what's happening here, right? All of the, the sailors are fighting with one another to run the ship, even though they've no idea how to do it, but they think it's not, you don't need a skill to do it. You don't need knowledge to do it. Any old person can do it. Um, so, so they call skilled sailor that the man who is skilled at figuring out how they will get to rule, right? Um, and the man who actually knows how to rule, the person who has a knowledge of the of the ship's business, um, they call that person useless, right? So, so for the true pilot, um, knows how to sort of calculate the seasons and sort of pay attention to the winds and everything like that. Right, but that person's knowledge is not esteemed or held in high value. Um, so the sailors pretty much ignore that person and compete with themselves um, for running the ship. Right, so this is sort of Plato's depiction of the, the kind of chaos of a sort of democratic governance where people who are unskilled at ruling are sort of um, fighting with, with one another who's gonna have that preference and they call skilled the person who, who is good at figuring out how they will get to rule, right? So that person, uh, the distinction here, as, as we'll see, is the philosopher and the sophist. And Plato is here picking out the sophist as the person who gives the unskilled the sort of confidence that they're able to rule when in fact um, they don't really possess that knowledge at all. So the sophist's kind of skill or expertise is a kind of illusory expertise of, of feigning knowledge when it's not when it's not really there, when it doesn't really apply. It's really the knowledge of how to persuade other people, but not the kind of expert knowledge that knows how things should be done, how the ship should be run, how the city should be governed, etc. So the clear message from the ship analogy is that we shouldn't blame philosophers uh, for being useless, right? The fact that philosophers don't seem to have, have a role, the fact that they um, don't seem to have a designated place in society, Socrates says, um, that's because society 
refuses to make use of, of, their, of the philosopher's talents, doesn't put them in the place for which their talents are best suited. We know what that place is. The philosophers are best suited to rule, right? So, so it's a it's a uselessness that that comes from not being sort of put into their socially prescribed role. If they were put into that role, um, they would have their sort of socially designated place and wouldn't be useless. All right, so we come upon here in a kind of elitism in this chapter that, and of course we've seen traces of this um, in the earlier chapters, but here we encounter um, a kind of elitism in the in the reference to what Socrates calls the best and the ordinary. So we hear references to um, the best nature, uh, the nature that is, um, the nature that is the 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 superior nature the one that is sort of um the one that is the the best the one that stands out as opposed to the ordinary um and the the kind of suggestion the suggestion is that the best um are the people who are sort of naturally drawn to things like philosophy right so the best people are those who um, are naturally drawn to philosophy but of course if if philosophy is corrupted um, or if they're not given the right philosophical education they become corrupt and they become corrupt in the very special way that the best people become corrupt that is they become exceptionally corrupt um, so there's so there's a kind of the struggle, and this is the sort of sense that Socrates gives in this chapter, that the struggle is between the best natures, those who are sort of raised in the right way. Um, but if the best nature becomes corrupted, you know, those people become extraordinarily corrupt because of all the sort of extra capacity um, that marks them as the best. So this, um, this sort of, this idea of the best um, in comparison with the ordinary, um, is a really um, is a really sort of important I think part of this chapter and reflects um, a certain elitism about what people are capable of by nature um, that is sim just simply seems to be part of Plato's sort of stock assumptions about how the, how the world works um, and of course we've sort of seen that in these we've seen that partly in the setup of the Republic itself with Glaucon and Adimatus these two sort of nobly born brothers of Plato who are being educated in philosophy and the whole book is in a sense a sort of a competition for their for their souls and for their agreement are they going to be um, persuaded by Socrates and think philosophy is the best life and if they're not persuaded by philosophy these are the type of young men that presumably um, would be attracted by tyranny um, and of course we've seen We've seen signs of that in the book itself with Glaucon and Adimatus sort of asking Socrates, well, you know, obviously we don't believe these things, but tell us why tyranny is not the best life for human beings and so on. And the sort of challenge of Gaiji's ring. So this is this is a sort of another part of that elitism that I think runs through Plato's thinking. There's a very interesting exchange on page one. 72 to 3 um, that I think shows us in a really clear way um, the the relation of the sophist um, to the demos or to the people now in, Gr in Greek the word demos um, basically means the people but it has this focus certainly in the ancient world um, it has this kind of almost pejorative sense where it's not demos in the sort of sense of the people governing the, themselves it's almost in the sense of the people being a kind of mob um, a kind of collection of people that that don't really then it's not really rational because it's a mob and they do things collectively that each of us wouldn't sort of do on our own um, so it's this sort of denigrating idea of the demos as um, as a sort of a, a sort of mob or a crowd or an irrational kind of group um, and this is this is the way this sort of comes out in Socrates' description here in, in how the sophist relates to the demos. Um, and he notes that he says each of these private wage earners, 
um, whom these men call sophists and believe to be their rivals in art, educates in nothing other than these convictions of the many, which they opine when they are gathered together. So the, the word here is doxa, the opinions, the sort of, um, which we've seen Plato talk of as sort of in the middle between knowledge and ig ignorance is this level of doxa or opinions. Um, and so the sophists educate in these in these sort of opinions of, of the many. It's almost like the sophists are experts in the opinions of the many, how to manipulate them, how to sort of bring them forth, how to change them, how to in, how to inflate and intensify them. Here's this description I think is very interesting. Socrates says it, it it is just like the case of a man who learns by heart the angers and desires of a great strong beast. Um, and this reference here to a great strong beast, I think, is very interesting. Um, where have we, where have we heard a reference to somebody sort of appearing like a great strong beast elsewhere in the text? Well, one place we we definitely heard that was in chapter one when Thrasymachus, the sophist, was getting up to speak. Um, and he sort of appeared to Socrates like this scary wild animal. He's this sort of wild beast and he's so frightening. Um, here we find that metaphor again. Um, now the beast is the is is the demos um, and the beast is, is the thing that's going to be controlled by the sophist. So how it should be approached, how it should take and hold of and when and as a result of what it becomes most difficult or most gentle and particularly under what conditions it is accustomed to utter its several sounds. So this this real sense of the the sort of demos, the, the people as a kind of um, as a kind of irrational mob very strongly coming through here. And in turn, what sorts of sounds uttered by another make it tame and angry. So it's sort of manipulating the emotions of the mob. When he has learned all this from associating and spending time with the beast, he calls it wisdom and organizing it as an art turns to teaching. Knowing nothing in truth about which of these convictions and desires is noble or base or good or evil or just or unjust, he applies all these names following the great animal's opinions calling what delights it good and what vexes it bad. He has no other arguments about them, but calls the necessary just and noble, neither having seen nor being able to show someone else how much the nature of the necessary and the good really differ. Now, in your opinion, wouldn't such a man in the name of Zeus be out of place as an educator, says Socrates. So think of, look at how this distinction of this sort of description of what the sophist does is so different from the knowledge of the philosopher, which is a kind of expertise. And as we'll see shortly, it's a kind of intellectual expertise, a sort of knowledge of permanent things, right? The sophist doesn't, doesn't have a kind of knowledge like that. The sophist's knowledge and art is about all about the opinions of the many, about the things that they call good and about how to increase and intensify or to decrease those opinions. In other words, how to manipulate those opinions. That's what the sophist's expertise is all about, right? So the sophist isn't interested in, as Plato might say, what's good in itself, what's true in itself, right? The sophist is only interested in um, what are the things, what are the things that according to the opinions of the many are called good? Um, what are the things that they think intensify that goodness? How is that goodness threatened? What do we have to fear is going to take that goodness away? If you know all of those things and you can manipulate the, the feelings and the emotions of the crowd and you can manipulate their opinions, um, bringing them to sort of intensify those opinions in, in relation to certain stimuli or certain prompts. So this is a sort of manipulative view of, of sort of teaching as manipulating the sort of emotions and opinions of, of, the, of the crowd, of the demos, um, rather than sort of knowing, knowing what is good for people and trying to teach them the good. So two very different sort of ideas of education. Okay, now let's think about the um, the forms and the ideas and how um, how they're related to um, some of the themes we've been talking about. 
Now, they were, we touched on this in chapter five, in book five, and it's, it's sort of, it emerges at the end of book six, when Plato talks about this idea of a good in its, of a good itself, a fair itself, and so on, for all the things that we set down as many. Now again, we refer to the, to the one idea of each as though the idea were one. We address it as that which really is. <clears throat> so this is going to be um, the thing to grasp here that for Plato, all material things that exist have a single form, a single idea, uh, which is the sort of genuine thing itself. And all the material things, um, all the material things that are referred to by that idea are simply sort of imperfect copies, um, imperfect sort of representations of that idea. This is what we've got to get into our heads with Plato's idea of the Plato's theory of the forms, the ideas that only the forms or ideas are true. Everything else that partakes of the forms like material reality is only, only partially true. It's opinion and not real truth. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so we have to think of if we ask what are the forms, what are the ideas, they are mind independent entities that are non-temporal, they don't change through time, and non-spatial, they're not located in space, we can't go and look for them, they simply are. So if you like, they're sort of in an intellectual space, we can, we can, we can sort of intuit them intellectually, um, but we can't, they're not in, actually in space and they don't sort of change through time. So all material and intellectual objects accessible to thought have a corresponding idea or form. That's really important that there's an idea or form um, corresponding to material things and intellectual objects like mathematical objects, for example. So if we take fruit, um, an apple or a pear um, or a peach or, or whatever, right? Each, if we have a single pear, Right, that thing is a sort of is a is a material thing that is related to the form of being a pair. So there's a single form of being a pair, and there are sort of many, many different material things that we call pairs, but there's only one form, right? Same with an apple, um, same with an orange, same with any fruit, same with anything, right? Now, each pair that we see may be imperfect in very in various ways. It may have bruises on it, it may have cuts on it, it may be sort of deformed, it may have an odd shape, right? But we can still recognize it as sort of part of, we can still recognize it as sort of belonging to the form of being a pair, even though it's imperfect. But for Plato, that's a key characteristic of all, all material things except the forms themselves, namely they are imperfect, right? So, a pear may, may sort of, may it, over time it may rot, it may grow stale, um, and there's gonna come a point at which it ceases to be a pear, it just disintegrates, right? So that's a key thing about all material things that embody a form. At some point that form disintegrates because they decay, they pass away, as all material things do, and so they lose the form, the form is no longer there. The form itself still exists in this intellectual space, right? But the things themselves have the forms and then they don't have them. And this is one of the big reasons for why Plato thinks we need to assume that there are these things called forms or ideas, because we need this kind of permanence and stability, right? Material objects change and decay, so we can't, we can't identify forms securely using material things. It has to be a sort of intellectual representation, intuition, um, or sort of thought that, that guides us towards the form and tells us what it is. Um, same in the form of a chair, right? We can see a number of material things that have this form. Um, and we can think of, you know, there are sort of borderlines here. When is something a stool or when is something a chair? And there we have to appeal to the form of a chair and, and sort of and, and sort of compare our idea of the form of a chair with the real thing and see if it really matches or if it's sort of better matched to a different form of a different 
of a different thing. So in case of, of the chair, we would want some kind of, you know, maybe it has legs, maybe uh, maybe it's four legs, maybe we allow six legs. It has to have some kind of back support, right? Otherwise it's a stall. Um, so we, we want to sort of have that. Um, so those features are necessary for something to be a chair, right? But you know, again, some sort of chairs that we find in reality may have these things to some extent. Um, some chairs, you know, may be destroyed, some may be broken, um, but the form of a chair always embodies the, those those sort of ideas and the, the sort of guidelines that make something a chair. All right, so I think a good way to sort of think about it is with geometric objects sort of and sort of mathematical truths and math mathematical forms right so if we take something like a triangle right we can say something like only the idea or the form of a triangle is perfect right because it may be that every triangle we've ever seen in real life has some imperfection it's not perfectly drawn it's not perfectly represented Right, you know, if, if we sort of measure it, there's a you know there's a sort of a very small angle that's off, right? So, so the so the way to think of a sort of perfect triangle is it's a sort of intellectual idea, right? You know, what makes something a triangle? And the way to think about that is if somebody, um, is if somebody says to you, um, look, I've just seen this amazing triangle and it has four sides. It's totally amazing. Now. <clears throat> we know we sense intuitively that the response to that is not to say you know let me take a look at this triangle and see this four-sided triangle right there's a what we want to say here is we don't need to see it to know that it's wrong right our, our sense that it's wrong comes not from seeing it it comes from our intellectual idea of what a triangle is so we would say that our intellectual idea of a triangle comprises the idea that the interior or the interior angles add up to 180 degrees and it comprises the idea that it has three sides right so that's part of the idea of a triangle so if we're sort of confronted with a the possibility of a of a four-sided triangle we know instantly it's not a real possibility because that doesn't correspond to the idea of a triangle. So you can see here how the idea kind of regulates what we take to be real in, in reality. We don't sort of guide, our idea is not sort of constructed by what real triangles there are. It's almost the reverse, that we, we understand what an actual sort of triangle is, something in, in material reality, through our idea of a triangle. And only our idea of a triangle is perfect, all actually all actually existing triangles may be imperfect in some way now another thing is mathematical truths like this very simple mathematical truths one of the few mathematical truths that i can still work out um two plus two equals four the question here is how what makes it true or what's the how do we think about the truth value of this equation right is it is it true because we just counted two things and then we had two more things and then we found that it's four is it possible that the next time we have two things and the next time we have two things we're going to count and find that it's five what gives us the confidence that two plus two equals four is true not just now right not just in this instance or not just the last time i tried it what gives us the confidence that it's true always and every time we calculate and again the answer is is that these are sort of intellectual ideas that we're dealing with they're intellectual truths and not truths that are sort of guaranteed by experience guaranteed by what we see in the material world and what we can calculate using material things it's a it's an intellectual idea it's true not because of material reality but it's true 
just because we we intellectually discern um, and calculate that it's true. So we don't again we don't need material reality to tell us right. Material reality just confirms what we already know from knowing the idea. Okay, let's take a, a closer look at some of Plato's arguments for why we need to assume that the forms exist. And the first point to look at is this idea of imperfection, and we saw this with the triangle. Forms are entities that perfectly embody properties like circular, equal, or justice and beauty, more sort of, you know, substantive properties and not just mathematical properties. Um, that we may have only ever experienced imperfectly in the world of sense experience. So in the material world, we've only ever seen it imperfectly, right? So in the form, we see that we see a sort of perfect circle. We see a perfect idea of equality. We see a perfect triangle. Um, and also things like, things like justice that again in the um in the real world only ever have an imperfect kind of embodiment right we only ever see justice imperfectly carried out through you know through law courts or through sort of social rules um or through sort of rules about social e equality and how individuals are to be treated but those things only imperfectly embody justice right we can think of perfect justice as a kind of idea um, that we can think of intellectually and in fact it's a really <clears throat> it's a really important thing because we could argue that, that that's sort of that's what's going on in this book it's almost like this thought experiment um, to imagine the idea of justice to imagine the idea of justice as a sort of perfect thing um, and as we've seen especially in chapter five some kind of curious things happen when we sort of try to imagine justice in this sort of perfect way like this. So this is a kind of meta reflection almost on the book as a whole and the book sort of setting out to to give us this account of justice, which looks um, like it's created for a perfect world in a lot of senses. But of course, we know that, you know, experience and material reality is messy and imperfect. Um, in all these many ways. And of course, we've seen that gives us a problem in how we interpret what Plato is doing in this book and how we read his intention in giving us this um, this, this sort of idea of justice that, um, that looks problematic when we try to sort of marry it to how we think about um, sort of the, the sort of natural requirements of material reality, um, family, um, and sort of uh, social solidarity and that sort of thing. So another thing that Socrates or Plato maybe thinks of is knowledge um, and the sort of their role in the forms. When we know something, what is our knowledge of? Um, and I think it's, it's Plato that assumes that what is known must be a class of permanent, stable and unchanging objects. Right. So when we say we know something, right, we're not just saying that we kind of um, that that something appears to us in a certain way at this instant. We're saying we sort of know something permanent and stable about um, about a thing. Right. So in the world of, of opinion, in the world of becoming where things are constantly changing. Right. The apple is constantly decaying. The, the sort of the piece of fruit is constantly um, you know, decaying and, and getting rotten and sort of it's losing its form, right? Knowledge is, is uncertain, right? Things, things lose their forms all the time. Things change forms. And only if we have a sort of a permanent, stable and changing class of objects, can we say that we have a kind of permanent knowledge of things. And that's, that's sort of Plato's definition of what knowledge has to be. So the third argument is a kind of semantic argument. Um, in other words, an argument about language rather than about things themselves. Basically, Plato thinks that when you talk about justice, or when I talk about justice, 
The problem is, how can we be sure that we are talking about the same thing? How can we be sure that our words refer to the same thing, right? And if our words don't refer to the same thing, then there's a problem of confusion and understanding. We just can't, we can't talk to each other about it because we're, we're referring to different things and we don't understand what each other is saying. So Plato thinks the only way we can avoid that problem is if we assume a form, an idea of justice, so that if we disagree, we cannot both be right, right? So if we disagree, then one of us is not getting the form right, okay? If we're talking about different things, then we can disagree as much as we want, but then we're not really having an argument. Um, we're not really sort of getting closer to the truth. We're just kind of talking past one another. But if we assume there's a single form, a single idea, then if we're disagreeing, one of us is missing the mark and missing the target. And that's that's sort of that's assumed for the possibility of disagreement, right? So if disagreement about justice is real, that must mean that there's a single thing called justice, and we're disagreeing about that single thing when we're talking about our disagreement. Okay, at the end of the, the chapter, Plato gives us this um, metaphor of the divided line. And this is a nice bridge between chapter six and chapter seven, um, the discussion of the world of the forms at the end of chapter six. And as we'll see, the sort of allegory of the cave, beginning of chapter seven, that takes these themes, takes these themes further. So in the divided line, we've got um, a line cut in two and then sort of divided further so that we've got four sections and they're, they're four sections of, of sort of the four different types of knowing according to Plato these four different kinds of, of knowing that sort of represent a kind of um, a kind of bridge where, where we sort of go from the lowest level to the highest level um, so we start with the realm of what's called conjecture or images um, or shadows sometimes referred to so something like sort of the image of a tree or the shadow of a tree um, and that's sort of the next stage from sort of images and shadows and the next sort of stage which is supposedly more real <clears throat> is what Plato calls belief um, it's actually doxa, th this whole sort of this whole sort of level of, of becoming or opinion, the physical world of the senses is all doxa. Um, belief um, that Plato refers to here is of physical objects, right? So why do we believe that physical objects are sort of more real than conjecture and shadows? Very simply, if you see a shadow, it may, or a sort of reflection, it may give you a distorted perception of the thing you know its proportions aren't right it doesn't show you the color of the thing it doesn't really show you what it looks like it, it's, it's a sort of distorted perception right so so seeing a physical thing seems to be closer to reality than just seeing a, a sort of conjecture or shadow um, and that's what that's what Plato is sort of aiming at here um, so this whole level is is becoming the level of opinion or doxa um, and it's it's the physical world of, of the senses so for plato this represents the world of sense experience the world in which we use our physical senses um, of sight sound touch and so on um, to 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 come to know the physical world and the two levels of conjecture um, followed by belief i ca I and pistis um, in greek and then we move on to the invisible world of reason. Um, and this is the world of being as opposed to becoming, right? So it's not changing, it's stable and permanent. And it's not the world of opinion, it's, it's the world of intellect. Um, it's the world of intellectual objects that can be known by the mind, not by the senses, or by the, the reason and not by the senses. And there are two levels here, dianoia, or understanding and noesis, um, knowledge and, and um, maybe science is sort of the, the Latin word for knowledge, I guess. Um, so knowledge is as knowledge of the form specifically um, as the sort of summit of this whole movement. Um, so mathematics for Plato is a higher form of knowledge 
and sort of um, belief about physical things. Um, here we're sort of dealing with things in general. We're beginning to get a better understanding and we're dealing with hypotheses about things. Right, so we start from assumptions and then build from there about what things are like, about what properties they have um, and what properties can apply to classes of things in general and how to calculate general properties about things. So we're starting to get some real sort of deeper knowledge about things other than their surfaces and their appearances. And that's how we're going into this world of being, um, this world of intellect, firstly through a kind of mathematical understanding. And Plato had a very high regard for mathematics. It's it's a sort of um, it's a high level inquiry. Of course, it's not as um, it's not as elevated as philosophy, but, you know, Plato um, is a philosopher. So, um, you know, he's going to say that. So when we get to the idea of knowledge, when we get to the when we get to the sort of knowledge of the forms, that's when we reach the summit of of, of knowledge, the summit of um, of knowing, where we begin to see the forms themselves, the forms of justice and beauty, and we're able to sort of um, and we're able to begin to know what they're composed of. Plato often speaks like it's a kind of intuition, like it's a kind of seeing that we we sort of see the forms as we see as we see physical objects with our senses, but it's with our mind's eye. Um, the thing here is we have to kind of be wary of that metaphor because, of course, when we know the forms, what we know are kind of um, propositions and properties of things like properties of the triangle, um, not kind of um, things that we can just intuit, things that we can just see, but things that we have to sort of work through um, and know rather than just sort of perceive. So it's a different, it's a different structure of knowing. Um, so as we'll see, this is the sort of four level scheme and we'll meet this right at the beginning of book seven in the allegory of the cave you'll see these stages at work as we sort of move through that move through that allegory okay so some important conclusions for this week we saw that socrates describes the popular view of philosophers um they're either useless or vicious and why philosophers are held in low esteem in everyday life. Um, as we saw, that's because of these corrupted philosophers um, who sort of um, go on to collude with sophists. And it's also because of the useless, um, the, the sort of status of the good philosophers is useless. But as we saw, that's society's fault for not putting them in, in charge, for not letting them rule, um, and not philosophers fault. Socrates describes the relationship of the sophist to the demos um, in a really fascinating description that recalls Thrasymachus and recalls Thrasymachus's sort of art of rhetoric of sort of getting up and giving a, a, a sort of speech that's expected to be praised. And we see that in this relationship of the, the sophist to the demos, where the sophist is basically manipulating emotions and reactions um, and has a knowledge of those reactions and emotions and how to manipulate them. You know, almost like you're sort of playing on a piano, you're playing on these emotions. And we can see very clearly how that's distinguished from the kind of knowledge that Socrates is talking about, which is a kind of expert knowledge of how things are, that's then sort of used to, to apply to society, to organize it in the most rational way. It's not a manipulative knowledge. It's a sort of perfect knowledge of, of things in a sort of perfectly ideal reality. And we saw that reality is sort of part of Plato's theory of the forms or ideas. And this is a key part of Plato's epistemology, his theory of knowledge and metaphysics, his theory of reality. Um, but that this sort of division between our material reality and our material selves and our intellectual sort of reality is, I think, a really important part of Plato's um, of Plato's metaphysics and his thinking. And when we when we sort of see it through the forms um, and this idea that the forms are in fact more real than than sort of material things and reality itself, we can see some interesting implications of that idea um, and how to apply that idea.